uh, it's your membership in Maine Audubon and your County Audubon uh, that enables us to put on these programs. So we greatly appreciate your membership and support. And if you're not a member, we're delighted to certainly have you consider being one. If you live in your county and you become a member of Maine Audubon, you are then automatically a member of your county Audubon. So it's a good two for deal, an excellent one. So uh, before we get to tonight's program, I'll just mention briefly that we have another exceptional program lined up for next month on Tuesday, March 16th at same time, 7 p.m. We're gonna be joined by Edwin Scholes, who is the leader and project leader, project founder of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Birds of Paradise project. And he spent the last 20 years or so documenting in the field all 42 species of birds of paradise, mostly in New Guinea and that part of the world. And it should be an exceptional program. So please join us on March 16th as well. And uh, tonight, uh, we have a program about a bird that is not quite as colorful as Birds of Paradise, but still a fascinating bird. It is uh, the American crow, I think some fish crows thrown in as well, that have been roosting every night during the winter for many years in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And joining us tonight for this program are Bob Fox and Dana Duxbury Fox, who are, we are delighted to have with us. Uh, Bob was co-author of the 19th, excuse me, 2013 definitive work, The Birds of New Hampshire, that documented the uh, then 427 species of birds that had been observed in New Hampshire. He was also involved in the founding of the Manomet Institute, a wonderful bird science and conservation organization. Uh, Dana has been uh, a birder for decades as well. They've both been birding for over 50 years. They've uh, observed the number I saw, probably higher now, 6,500 species around the world. Uh, Dana's also been studying loons for decades and uh, we're delighted to have them here tonight and talk to us about this amazing crow roost phenomena. A uh, couple of last notes. Uh, after the program, we'll be having a Q&A. So if you have any questions you'd like them to take a crack at, uh, please feel free to hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in a question at any point during the program. And uh, one last plug as well, our standard monthly plug, keep your cats indoors. Your birds and bird of friends will greatly appreciate it. And now, uh, so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Bob and Dana and uh, proceed with the show. Thank you very much for being with us here tonight. So if you just hit uh, share screen. Let's go back here and do this. Um, uh, sorry. We that's okay. We're, we're, we're getting we're, we're getting there. Just hold a second. Yeah, we're we're enjoying the shot of you and Bob. Staring. Oh well, that that you don't know need. Okay, share screen. Here we go. Here we are. All righty. Good, good, good. That looks great. Fine. I will good see evening. you with some questions at the end of this program. Thank you very much, Bill. We really appreciate it, and we are so appreciative that. So many of you have turned in tonight. Bob and I are here to talk about those awesome crows of winter. 
and they're really COVIDs during COVID. I, with my Massachusetts accent, often pr pronounce COVID is COVID, so uh, it just works out very well. But tonight we're going to share with you this, um, this wonderful experience that we have had over the past few years. Our goals tonight are to observe the crows, to study and document their staging and roosting behavior, and to share this awesome experience with others. Our, this is an outline of what we're going to talk about tonight, crows and not, what are co COVID's, major features of crows, the crows in Massachusetts and Maine, the history of this, uh, of winter crow roost and the Lawrence crow roost. We'd like to start out with some artsy things. Uh, it's interesting that this first um, picture to the left was a, one of the first pictures that we can find in the US of a crow. It was listed when Alexander Wilson uh, actually depicted it as uh, Corvus Caron, which is the European crow. At that point, they had not identified it as a separate species. And over on the right, you can see his fish crow, and he was the first one to describe it uh, when he uh, later on. Oops. Uh, next, we have the pictures of uh, Audubon and um, Fuertes, you can see that Audubon depicted the American crow in 1833 and two years later, the fish crow. Fuertes uh, depicted these in 1923, of the American crow and the fish crow. It's interesting to watch how these people depicted birds as time went on. Van Gogh actually depicted crows over these wheat fields in an 1890 painting. And Winslow Homer in 93, 1893, depicted crows over this fox in his painting called Fox Hunt. Moving much further afield, Don Eckleberry in 1951 depicted crows. But I love this. Don't you love this, Rudy? Herselmeyer in 1990, it looks more like a raven, but look at the boots on this bird. Isn't that fun? Uh, Barry Van Dusen has produced, who is an artist in Massachusetts and is illustrating quite a few uh, field guides these days, has produced some of these paintings of crows. This one is now in my personal collection. and. Now Bob is going to share with you information about the family of birds. <clears throat> yes, it's great to be with all of you and to have such a large audience. We normally don't have audiences quite this big, but I think it's wonderful that that number of people are out and interested. Uh, I first talk about COVID as a family. <clears throat> there are three parts that we know about uh, in that family are the Jays. You don't think those are part of them, but that's one part. The magpies are a second part. And then a third part are the 40 species of crows and ravens, the things that we're going to talk about for the rest of the evening. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. 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 Well, while she, I think you can hear me while she's getting organized on getting this next picture up. The, uh, the scientists use a lot of different names for the different levels of crows from the largest down into the small species. And so th those names are there. That's not worth worrying about. But as you uh, start to get used to the idea of how they uh, lay, and that's what we're going to get into here in just a minute. Uh, they, the original crow uh, tribe, if you want to call it that, the largest element that includes the crows, uh, was a uh, some birds that ended up on 
Australia, interestingly enough, and uh, uh, as Australia was on a plate uh, back 50, 60 million years ago, drifting across the Pacific, it, it came into the area of Southeast Asia. And when it got close enough to uh, the, uh, the continent, uh, this whole family just jumped off and landed and settled in there. And that's the first time they really decided to divide up into various uh, elements. And that's coming along in just a minute here, I hope. Anyway, so uh, th this is a little tricky and the map that I'm going, I'm going to use a map first and then I'm going to use uh, a word slide to uh, go back over it because it takes a little while to get used to it. Here is the map now and uh, uh, if you see down there, you can see Australia uh, down there and you can see it is sort of moving up towards Southeast Asia. And we're going to start with the black arrows that come off because the, the ancestors are that first black arrow that comes over and land in Southeast Asia. Then as you can see, it began to radiate and uh, two groups that came off uh, went to the left and one went down into Africa and the other came over into sort of North Central Europe. And so that was a major move. Now there's a third arrow coming out from there and that's the interesting one perhaps for us because that is the Jays. Remember I showed the picture of the Jays a few minutes ago and that is how the Jays evolved. They moved north in, uh, in Asia, crossed over the, the uh, what is the Bering Sea now. But remember this was during the ice age and all the a lot of the water was on the land and so this was a land bridge and things could go right across like from one tree to another. So the Jays came across and the arrow shows you them coming down through North America and they actually came down and, and there are a lot of Jays in Central America and even a few down in South America. So that was a very healthy move at that point. Now the, the next move is the central group uh, that was spawning all of these things gradually moved up in Asia and uh, they are now going on to the red lines and you see three red lines all sort of merge or start up there. The first one again, uh, as that group of Corvids was, uh, was starting to evolve, had a group that went over into the Europe and African area from there. But, and a second one came south, which is quite surprising. It went back and uh, settled down in Australia long after the uh, parents had left. But the third one is the one that we're, we want, because as you see, that like the J's go, goes up, crosses uh, over and comes down into North America. Now, when it got to the very northern Siberia there, uh, there was one bird and they split into two. One went uh, back to uh, Europe, uh, the Corona that we were talking about earlier, and the one that crossed over into Alaska, it became the American crow, the one that we all know. And you can see it came down and settled all of North America. Uh, also, as you wonder what happened to the um, <clears throat> to the ravens, the ravens followed along very shortly after and managed to cover the surface between uh, in the very northern part of uh, Eurasia and North America. And they stayed there limitedly working down into the lower parts. So while, while we're wait, wait, waiting for the next slide to come up, I might say uh, uh, back, uh, back in the 1980s, uh, the, uh, this this map was created back in the 1980s by the things. Okay, we have another thing. Here's, here's sort of a retread of what I was just saying. 53 million years ago, that's a long time ago, as Australia was moving close to the northern landmass of Southeast Asia, well. the ancestral COVID. <laughs> million years ago, the family, not the, the family of Corvids called Corvidae evolved in Northeast Asia. And 17 and a half million years ago, I mean, time is going by fast, the genus of crows evolved in the Palearctic, where the little red lines did. 
five billion years ago, the American crow evolved in Siberia and then radiated into North America. And four plus years ago, the uh, fish crow evolved farthest down in Asia, but came up and crossed as did the American crow. But instead of staying just in North America, it came down to about the Mexican border and went across. So the fish crow developed in, for us down in Southeastern uh, United States. And is, as you know now, is starting to move up into North America. This is, a, this is a picture that Dana and I took when we were over in Bhutan. Uh, if you want to see a large bill crow, this is technically a large bill crow, and it certainly has a large bill. And it's sitting on those little pretty pink flowers. Those are rhododendrons. Bhutan is loaded with species of rhododendrons, and that's one of my one of our other hobbies. We have about a hundred rhododendrons kicking around our house outside, and we're running a test on them. Here's some facts about crows that I think you'll find interesting. <clears throat> crows are a genus. That's the smallest group of the family called corvids. The species of crows have, in general, similar body shapes. They look alike. They have uh, a, a strong, uh, strong, stout legs that you can see by the little upside picture up there. Uh, they are <coughs> well clawed and very grasping feet. They can grab almost anything. They have large heads and, of course, a very a lot of brains in there, but a very distinctive bill. And so that is one of the things about all the crows in the world. Crows have been noted in most of the American Indian cultures because they would hang out around them. The American Indians appreciated the humor and the interest and the whole behavior of crows. And so they always kept recognizing them. They are highly intelligent. They're very, you, I'm always surprised at some of the things they do. They can outsmart us, I'll tell you that. And they are very social meaning they like to do things together. Uh, they have, uh, a, in part of their life, they uh, will have a family and the parents will, uh, will there'll be two parents, there'll be two, probably two young. And then the second year, uh, the parents and that first group of young, the, those, if they haven't gone off on their own, will stay and help the parents raise the next thing. So it's not uncommon for if you have a crow family around, there'll be four or five birds. The things that are most interesting tonight are that they are cooperative breeders, which I just explained, but they are co communal winter roosting birds. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the evening. Oh, I'm still talking a little bit more how you tell them apart, which is, I think, a good idea. These obviously are American crows. These are gorgeous pictures of, of them that it shows. Uh, you can see on this American crow, take this, any of the three of them, see the pantaloons, as Dane likes to call them, the little black feathers that come down to the joint. The joint. That's characteristic. That, see how heavy a bill it has, a very thick, heavy bill. And of course, those big legs and those big feet. So that, those are good, real pictures of crows. Now here is the uh, fish crow. Uh, Frederick Stubel was taking some pictures of them and this shows them. See uh, on, on either picture here, the tiny feet. See how tiny they are, That's how short the legs are. And notice the bill, it's not nearly as big and heavy as the other one. And uh, we'll get on to some other difficulties, but they are necessarily small. You will be able to see fish crows, not commonly now, but they are in, uh, coming up in Maine and every year you'll be seeing more of them. So you want to learn how to tell them apart. Uh, fish crows are smaller and have thinner bills. Look at the uh, pictures, including the one on the upper right hand corner, which is the best thing. And uh, the, okay, the, 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 the other one that's over there, the left hand one of the uh, left hand the top picture there. See how sh how thin the bills are. See how the how short the legs are compared to the American crow on the right. Uh, the, the the fish crows don't have any of those pantaloons like things uh, hanging down to their knees. And fish crows sit and act a more parallel to the ground. In other words, you, uh, an American crow has his head up and he's sort of almost looking up over the next wave. But the fish crow is uh, the back is sometimes almost close to being horizontal when you see them. 
American crows do uh, when they're out uh, wandering around, uh, the American crow will take one step. And if it's with a fish crow, the fish crow has to take three steps to keep up with it. They're cute to see. And we often see them now. You can probably see them in Maine if you view them. This particular t uh, a set of pictures by Louis Bivier uh, shows the uh, fish crow on the right being chased. And notice the size of the feet. And the bill, on the left. and notice the uh, the uh, side of the American crow on the right there, with their huge feet, big wings, and a big heavy bill. They are different, and you'll be able to tell the differences. This is just a little a picture that we took when they were uh, moving north one April. And uh, you can see them out in this sort of rough uh, area here in Lawrence. And you can see a couple of American crows standing big and with their heads right up. And in the background, you can see uh, most of the birds there are fish crows and that uh, small sized, low to the ground, horizontal look to them. They're quite distinctive when you get to know them. And now, uh, I'd like to share with you some uh, information about the growth in numbers in Massachusetts. We see here uh, from a breeding bird survey of both the American crow on the left and the fish crow on the right, the number changes. Uh, you can see that uh, with the, in about 2000, you had a great drop in the number of American crows. This was due to that um, despicable uh, virus that attacked the, the crows at that point. They have been increasing in numbers since then. But for the fish crow, you can see this very rapid increase in this area of the, the world. Uh, here is Christmas count, count data. And again, you can see the, uh, the drop there of the American crows, but again, the sort of stabilization of them, but that dramatic rise in the fish crow numbers. Uh, I've been trying to find out more and more and see crow migration um, myself. And this uh, year, the end of October, I was sitting at the Woodmont Orchard in Hollis, New Hampshire. And I observed for the first time crows migrating. They came across the street from my left, they went across the road, up to my right and over the orchard and disappeared to the Southeast. But amazingly, that's at that same time, there were people on Mount Wachusett hawk watching and they recorded in their non-raptor um, part of their report that that particular day they had had this extensive large number of American crows. And I then went and calculated the direction from the Woodmont Orchard to Mount Wachusett, also the distance and saw that the crows that I was seeing an hour later would have been down at Mount Wachusett and in contacting the hawk watchers, I, I was able to calculate that their, the time that they had seen it was the same time that the, the I had. Of, one interesting thing about that, we counted 1,200 crows coming across uh, the, the fields and heading uh, towards there. They had 1,200 crows at the rows. You talk about nailing down something that really sort of fits together. That was an amazing uh, day in the field. Uh, this is uh, quite a busy uh, overhead uh, here for these migrating crows in Maine. Bob gathered some of this data uh, from both Palma and Vickery's books. And I love the one in the 1900, the first one where it was 10 rods wide and took a quarter of an hour to pass over a given point. And the rod was 16.5 feet. Uh, also, uh, under the last uh, example, fish crows uh, were first reported at Bowdoin in 1976 and first bred in 1978. So you can see how they have moved into Maine as well. What is a communal winter road, roost? And why would crew, crows roost communally? A, a communal winter roost is a place where crows gather in the winter time. And uh, they come in and they pack in closely 
usually on the top in our area of deciduous trees. Sometimes in other areas, it's coniferous trees. And they do this, it is hypothesized to either learn about food supplies. In other words, where did the birds beside them find good foods that day? Or to avoid predators. Well, the main and uh, natural predator of the American crow is the great horned owl. And um, of course, man has also been a great predator of the owls there. But this is, um, they feel that if they're in these roosts tightly packed, they can easily, quickly, someone can alert them to a predator and they can protect themselves. I was re uh, reviewing the history of crow roosts and they go back to, the history goes back to the late 1700s. At that time, they were rural and they, some were very large, particularly ones in the Midwest. But in the 1700s, these crows, uh, 1970s, uh, crows moved into the cities. Amazing brilliance on their part. We don't allow hunting in cities. They had been persecuted in the rural areas. There's a report in one roost where people, hunters went in at midnight and shot until daybreak, uh, purely for the desire of killing the birds, nothing else. I'd like to tell you about a sorry, mute, uh, recent study. This is a study that was done by Andrea Townsend. Uh, in, it was reported in the AUK in 2018. It was about a crow roost in Utica, New York. Uh, she used satellite telemetry, stable isotopes, and molecular markers. And she found that the resident crows, i.e. those are the crows that nested within uh, 16 miles, uh, we say 20 miles of the, the roost, uh, were uh, there. She found migrant crows that had migrated at least, uh, some of them as many as 493 miles to the Northeast uh, between the latitudes of 44.4 and 48.4 North. And she was able to estimate that 80% of the crows in her roost were migrants. Now, this is, comes up. This is her study results. On the left in red are, is that one, she was able to put a satellite tag on one resident crow. And Utica is up in the upper right. And you can see where the crow went when it was up in the Utica area. But it went down to Clinton, New York to breed and was in and out of Clinton during the breeding season. On the right is the map of the five uh, migrant crows that she was able to tag. And you can see the tremendous distance to the Northeast that they travel to breed. Now on the lower right is the graph showing the analysis of the feathers. There's a deuterium level that is laid down in the, feather of a bird as it is developed on the bird. Crows um, actually uh, lose their feathers and put in on new feathers in September while they're still on the breeding latitude. So she was able to examine the feathers of the birds that were there under her roost and, and also the ones on the satellite tag ones. And she could see that uh, the majority of those that um, she examined were birds that had been put on in a latitude that was far to the northeast. The history of the Lawrence Crowries. It was first recorded in Bird Observer magazine in 18, 1989. And throughout the 1990s, people reported on the Lawrence Crows. The first fish crow was reported in that roost in 1994. 
and all records were from around the Merrimack River in the city. We visited the roofs once each winter from 2013 to 2017. But from the fall of 2007, uh, 2017, we've now visited the roofs over 400 nights um, during these past four winters. Initially, most nights they staged in a different place first, then roosted in the same place. Staging is what they do when they come in from either uh, where they have nested, I'll tell you more about that in a minute, or where they have spent the day feeding and they remain there until a certain point. And after it's dark, they move into the roost location. Here's a map showing 20 miles uh, radius from Lawrence. So you can see that the crows that are coming into uh, Lawrence are coming from a tremendous distance all the way over to the coast in Newburyport, down uh, a bit north of Boston, out into New uh, Southern New Hampshire and um, Westford uh, Mass, Lowell Mass, quite fascinating. Now, these are some observations on staging that Bob and I have been deducing. This is something you're seeing that's never been in print yet. So we're gonna share this with you tonight. But we believe that the initial crows that come into Lawrence to stage are resident crows. And resident crows come in from their nesting territories, either singly or in small family groups. This was, uh, documented by a professor named Kakamize in New Jersey, where he had them tagged and could see that the birds left their nesting territories um, in the afternoon, went into the roost, and then returned to the next day. I have a friend here in North Andover who sees this happen on a daily basis. She has a family that nests in the yard next door they come back every morning, they're there during the day, and in the afternoon, they go into the roost. Uh, many of these resident crows come in early, even pre an hour before sunset, and they seem to determine where they will all stage that night. Fish crows also come in early, and they seem to stay together. Some nights we've seen them in different parking lots in Lawrence, you know, there's a fish crow parking lot or there's a gathering of fish crows. It's interesting how they aggregate when they come in. They're also feeding uh, often during this period on bittersweet, buckthorn or crab apples. Later in the afternoon, large flocks of migrant crows come in closer to sunset. They follow flight lines into the city. Oh, I, and oop, see if I can go back. Um, we've lost a bit there. Uh, at, there are, a, there's a pattern that we've noticed of when the crows come in and you can see in October, there that we're getting mainly the resident crows. And then the migrants arrive and the migrants begin to leave as late February uh, occurs. And we've been counting the crows and trying to document this uh, from year to year. This is a map showing uh, some of the locations in Lawrence where the birds gather. That duck bridge in the center with that blue circle is the traditional initial roosting spot for the crows. And they may stage anywhere on the north or south side of the river. And at sun, after sunset, they will move into a final staging area right near the uh, uh, roost site. And when it's dark, now after sunset and after it's dark, they will move slowly into the uh, roost. 
This is another map showing one year uh, after they had been in the roost for a while uh, in end of December, they suddenly moved over uh, to the west onto the ice uh, of the frozen Merrimack River to the west of there. And then they, they took this tremendous counterclockwise circle up into upper reaches of the city and made a counterclockwise circle and eventually came back along the southern edge of the Merrimack River. This shows you a Google map of the city of Lawrence. You can see how densely it's populated. And that one open area up in the top there was that area where they moved to uh, once they left the ice, um, which is a large three cemetery complex. Here is the, uh, I'm gonna show you now some pictures of their staging. Here they are staging on the north side of the river. Some of them already in trees and many of them, as you can see, peppering the skies above. Here are some very attractive pictures taken by Betty Wiley. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful to come and see the crows when there is a uh, sunlit lit sky. And with the clock tower there of the New Balance factory building and the many church uh, steeples pep um, that pepper the sky of Lawrence, um, it makes it very impressive. Here we have a video that I'm gonna show you. This was taken January 13th. That was just taken January 13th of this year, just a few months ago. Oh, um, seems to want to show it again but it's worth seeing. Notice the way the birds <coughs> sit on the tops of the trees first. And notice how this is a, we call this a river of crows, the way they go along. It isn't a brook, it isn't a stream, it's a river. And here you get a swirling thing. That's another behavior thing that we like to see. Here are some pictures again um, taken of that night where the sky was so beautiful of uh, again, the church tower and the steep clock steeple. You can see here are some pictures taken later in the evening. Often some of them will gather on the ground uh, as they are getting ready to slowly move into the roost or they'll be sitting in nearby treetops. I like this one. This is the tower and a few crows. It was not eight o'clock. Somehow the clock was not working that night properly. Now, um, one night we were at a Nuttall Onothological Club meeting and we mentioned we'd seen 10,000 crows sitting on the ice that night um, in Lawrence. And someone came up to us and said, we'd love to see the crows. Uh, could you take me there? So we took him there the next night. Lo and behold, we went to that exact spot and there wasn't one crow on the ice. Talk about an embarrassing situation. But suddenly we saw crows going along above the trees on the southern side of the river. We got in our car and followed the north side of the river till suddenly about a mile out the crows turned at a right angle and moved over us and went up the hill. And they moved up to that cemetery that I showed you. And these are some stills of that. But this is what I wanna show you. I'll never forget this night. The black crows, the white snow, and the um, monuments in the 
she did that just by holding a camera out the wi out the window. She got that picture. I mean, it is it's really amazing what pictures you can get. And the crows uh, actually are sometimes staging in the city. This is one taken just the other night, early on, just at an hour before sunset, and you can see the number of crows here on the ice. And this shows where they are. They're west of the Route 28 bridge in the frozen Merrimack River. We were standing in that Riverside State Park location at that point, but we also go down to the Abe Bashara boathouse to observe them. Here it is later um, in the cycle of the evening and you can see far many more crows have now joined the original. These are not taken from the same night, but it is meant to show you how when the crow, the migrant crow flocks come in later on, there is a far greater density of crows. This was taken uh, by Erica just a couple nights ago from the boathouse, the picture on the left looking out over the river. And the crows absolutely love the ice. I, I thoroughly enjoy these two pictures on the right. The above one was a group of crows sitting on an ice flow floating down the river. They were happy as pigs in muck and they just, just were floating along. Below it is a picture of uh, an immature bald eagle that the crows were very uh, disturbed with and harassing. You can oh, see one of them. Pictures, and th these are Bob's pictures here on the right. Now roosting. Half hour after sunset, they begin to slowly move into the roost from a nearby staging area. The roost is usually no more than a kilometer from the final staging area. And it's dark. And they sit very close together. And they're noisy at first and suddenly they quiet down. This is a picture taken by Dick Lipsy of the crows. If you look along the upper uh, windows on the left there, you can see crows sitting on the tops of these trees. This is the um, New Balance roost uh, in this narrow set of trees along the river. Um, this is their roost of choice at the beginning of the uh, winter season. Here again, you can see where they are. Uh, the picture on the left is of um, Mr. Lipsy's again, taken looking with a bit of light in the sky of the crows as they fill the tops of those trees. The picture on the right shows them being um, coming down almost to the water's edge. Here is another view of um, Dave Lipsy's there, you can see them, how densely they fill in the treetops. This is a picture of ours from up in the cemetery when they chose to roost uh, at the far edge of the cemetery. Here's a tree after dark. With the Notice how the birds are all facing in one direction. They are like a, a, a windmill or something of that sort. That shows the direction the wind is coming from. Crows spit up like owls, a pellet, every two days. And pellets were collected and they were analyzed. And it's amazing, the first year in 2017 when this was done, uh, the uh, largest volume material was the Asian bittersweet. No wonder that um, invasive plant spread so rapidly. Uh, there were other pellets with safflower and corn. There were mice, mammals, songbirds, even one salt marsh snail, which had to have come probably from Newburyport. And then there were various non-food items. This is Tom French dissecting the pellets. He did this 
Uh, he was uh, at that point with the Mass Fish and Wildlife Group. This is his second analysis, the second year. Again, uh, a lot of seeds. This time, staghorn sumac was more prevalent and uh, various invertebrates and non-food items. Notice that there were small stones and glass in the non-food items. And since they're uh, resting on urban parking lots quite a bit, uh, that's probably not surprising. We have many visitors that have come, hundreds of visitors over the past few years who have enjoyed coming to see the crows. And Will Basad, who's now in Brunswick, I believe the young man on the right, um, I'm not sure if he's on the call tonight, but I know he has moved to Maine since that picture was taken. One of the things I wanted to point out is that Crows are allowed to be hunted in Maine. And there are two periods, February to April and August to September. There's no limits. And um, crows, uh, the only species that seems to be hunted purely for the pleasure of killing it. I also have been corresponding with various people in Maine about some of the winter crow roosts. And I'd love more information uh, from any of you who have it about others or more details about these. But uh, Louis Bevier was telling me that uh, they've had up to 15,000 crows in the Waterville um, roost. And um, in 2012, they had 10,000 at the CBC. Uh, also in Augusta, there were 10,000 seen in 2019 at the CBC, but none this year, or uh, this past year, and uh, the crows just weren't within the roost circle. I'm sorry, the CBC circle. And But they were seen staging on the ice in Hallowell nearby in January. Now in Portland, um, I've had uh, Mainers sending me information about uh, those that are staging near the Calvary Cemetery. So Again, please let me know more about this. You can see in the map of Maine there that both Waterville and Augusta are along rivers. They love to be along a river. There's a roost in Hartford, Connecticut and Springfield, Mass along the Connecticut. Ours, as you know, is in uh, along the Merrimack and often there are birds along the, in Manchester, New Hampshire, along the Merrimack. So. Um, rivers are great places for roosts. Tonight, I'd like to read you um, a, a poem uh, by Mary Panad. Mary is from Boston. It seems that poems are in vogue at this point. So, expert town crier, I am great. Guard extraordinaire, nothing but nothing gets by me without note. Sure raconteur, I am wise to all, ever certain ever free, glossy, bossy, braggadocio. Is there anything, anything at all? I do not know. And I love this illustration on the left, which was in an article in the New York Times about agriculture, but just seemed to fit my fancy. So we'd love to have you join us next winter at the roost. If you can make it even this year in the next couple of weeks, they're still there. And we certainly want to thank David Doubleday for inviting us to the York County Audubon for hosting us and to all of you for watching. We are Dana and Bob and we're in North Andover. That's my email. So please uh, let me know if uh, there's anything more that um, you'd like to know. I turn yeah. it back to Bill and Nick. Good. I'm actually not sure if Bill, oh, Bill is back. Okay, good. I didn't know if he made it back on. Um, so Bill, I'll let, you, I'll let you handle questions. Okay. There I am. Well, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Uh, I have a few questions here. Um, we'll start with uh, uh, a, a critical one, which is how do you count them? Uh, with difficulty. 
but I'm going to let Bob describe that because that's a um, something that he loves to do. And he's the official counter for this roost. Yeah. It's a skill that you learn. Uh, it's sort of like uh, playing the piano. Anyone can pick away at it, but to get good, you have to practice a lot and, and have some technique. The, I was taught by a person by the name of Ludlow Griscom, uh, who was a, a, a professor at Harvard when I was there, and I was head of the, uh, the undergrad bird club. So we taught the whole group how to do it. What you do is learn to count by numbers. So let's assume you had 100 dots on a piece of paper. You would look at it quickly and say, there's five together, and then there's another five and a third five. So it's sort of like cutting out groups of five and you go through the flock quickly and see how many groups of five you get. And then you maybe increase it to tens and you can eventually get up to 25s. The higher you get though is the greater your chance of error. But nonetheless, you as you practice, now 100 dots on a page is not any problem. You, you turn the page, you look at the page for four seconds and have to count it. But when you get five, four or 5,000, Dots, let's call them crows sitting in, a, in some trees or on a, on a barn or, or on the ice somewhere. It's a lot harder to do. And so you have to develop this skill so you can do it and do it fairly rapidly because they don't give you, if they're flying by you, you have to be at the same speed they are or you miss them. And using a clicker is a good way to do it. And you don't have to remember what hundred or what thousand number you're on to, you just click it along and, and keep your concentration. It is a concentrated thing. Anyone can learn it. I've taught it to people that I didn't think could tell one bird from another, and it, it works, but it's it's simply that kind of a skill. I'm willing to teach anybody about it or show them how to do it in, in more detail if you're interested. I was talking to Brian Harrington, who is the red knot man from uh, Manama. And he was saying that he uses something like a uh, app called wildlife counting. And uh, when he is going out with his people to count shorebirds, they often practice with that uh, to try and hone in their skills to improve on the accuracy of doing it. I might add a, a postscript to that. Uh, the way I like to check is to find another counter. You you know who these pe people are. They're scattered around everywhere. And I like to count and have them count side by side. And then one of us says, oh, we write down what we got for a count. If you are in that league, you are going to be probably within uh, four four percent of each other. And somewhere between your 4% is probably the actual number. So that's the way you go. So when we count, we do that. We don't take someone that has 100 and has a th another one has 1,000 and 100 uh, and say, well, we'll compromise on 500. That's, that's not counting. That's, that isn't even estimating. That's, that's foolishness. People do it, but that's still not, it doesn't tell people what it is. You've got to do it with people. You can practice with people. And frankly, it's it's good. It's a, it's a good thing to do and it's a fun thing once you learn how. And about how many minutes does it take to scan the roost and come up with your count? Well, that's the thing, Bill. The roost is, remember when it's dark. Yeah. So most of the counting of any crows in a winter situation is done, in my opinion, during the staging. And often the crows roost in an obscure situation where you may not be able to see them. In Lawrence, you have some ambient light from some of the buildings in that to give you a little bit of help. But uh, and what we discovered this year, much to our surprise, is that the birds also move into the roost very slowly. I don't know of anyone who has um, actually counted the roost, you know, every 10 minutes, every hour, whatever, and, to, and tried to find out uh, what the pattern is of crows entering a roost on a particular evening. But um, they don't enter it, we discovered all at once. And so 
you have to be there over a period of time in order to uh, get any uh, true from the roosting part of it. We've been counting them as they're going into the final stage. Um, one of the slides that didn't come up there, it skipped it on mine, was the numbers we've seen over the past few years. And as it turns out, um, you, uh, we found that as they move up the river over the bridge, you can count them if you're, you're uh, working uh, well at it in experience in counting um, in this river of birds that come over you. And, uh, but that's in a staging, they, they were moving from their main staging area to the final staging area. And, and then one time that was that was taken by a guy we call Bob, and uh, Bob took those pictures one night. He was out counting with me another night. He is a good counter, and we counted up. And I said, "Well, how many you have?" And he said, "Well, you know, uh, uh, twenty thousand, maybe a few birds more." And I said, "I'm at 20,200. 20, that's what you get when you get good counts. He's together. talking yeah. about the video from the yeah. garage roof that, yeah. that I showed. Okay, I have a, another question. Do uh, cr American crows and fish crows, are they known to interbreed at all? Not that or I know of. Know? Okay. Know of. They're genetically quite separate. And do crows have uh regional differences uh one questioner asked about referred to a book by jennifer ackerman about the intelligence of birds and wondered whether new england crows are different in any way from crows elsewhere in the country um i know that uh the the famous story uh by professor Mosloff of university of washington in seattle where he was um going to do an experiment on the crows on the campus and they decided to put a mask it was a neanderthal man's mask on the researchers that were going out to capture these crows and do something to them and uh john Mosloff has told me that generations later those crows are still passing on to their young the information that anyone that looks like this Neanderthal man, in fact, if you put that mask on, you will still be um, absolutely harassed by the crows on that campus, although that was years and years ago now. So crows have a very, very strong memory. Uh, there's a story of hunters in the Midwest who would go into a blind as a group. The crows supposedly could count as the crow, the hunters left there and they wouldn't go back there till all the counters had left. I'm not sure whether that's apocryphal, but I do know that um, a story from uh, June Aga Chamberlain, who was a crow researcher on Cape Cod, said that they knew her appearance, they knew her car, and they would respond accordingly depending upon you know what they had done. Bob and I are, or I am certainly hyper uh, cautious. I want to observe the birds, not disturb the birds. So as often as I can, I won't even get out of the car. They probably know our car. They say, here they come again. But um, we try not, we try to observe them and not change their behavior because we were there. Mm -hmm. I have one oh. example. You talked about intelligence of the of the birds and extent and uh, what they would do. The Maslow ex experiment could happen here or anywhere, but there's the, there's a crow out new uh, crow species in New Caledonia that it sort of put intelligence ahead. It can design tools. It can take a stick sharpen it or pick the right stick and use the stick to dig in a hole and, and bring out food and this sort of thing. And so uh, some of the crows are that intelligent. Most of them are not, but I still think they're smarter than we are because they, they can keep doing a lot of things that we can't figure out about them. 
Right. Uh, a question that might be of concern to people in Lawrence is uh, what volume of uh, excrement, for lack of a better term, is produced by the roost each night? Does it is a cleanup required? Well, uh, you remember that picture of New Balance and the trees along the river. Yep. When they're in that roost, all is well because they are in a narrow set of trees along the river and there's no one living there or going there almost on a daily basis. So that area, they are not bothering the citizens. Um, and fortunately, uh, last winter, they were um, suddenly, uh, they were disturbed, I believe, by people who were out on the bridge near the New Balance uh, roost on November 3rd. And they suddenly left there. And um, until the 19th, they were just all around. They were on the ground. They, they just couldn't seem to settle in, but they weren't going to go back into that roost because I they there had been people with uh, tripods and long, you know, big cameras, and they were on the bridge for hours. And I think the crows equated those people with hunters. And they've had such a persecution from hunting that they uh, never went into the roost again that winter. A few weeks ago, we had uh, a couple of birders wanting to see the things. And so the four of us got under one of the stagings, uh, which it moved out and was in a whole group of trees. And that was nice. You could look up and get appreciated. And uh, that was good until we stopped and went away. I had about 40 droppings on my car. I had three or four on my clothes. They all, I, we had to wash everything we had on because we were standing out and washing them. Yes, and you, you don't stand under a, a flock of crows. But once they have moved, last winter when they took that unusual move uh, early, they moved to an area where there was no housing, no people. Uh, and in the other uh, two years, they have moved, uh, around every night. So they haven't created a, um, a real uh, right. harassment. And the Department of Agriculture has the legal authority to kill them, if not harass them. Yeah. And so that is not a good thing if mm -hmm. they are using the same roofs within a uh, urban area. I know the city of Gloucester two years ago brought in the Department of Agriculture to harass them. And I don't know whether they even have a right. roost there anymore. Well, I'll, I'll wrap up with one final question, which is, could you relate the uh, most amusing or interesting anecdote you can think of in your observation of crows? All right. OK, uh, it's a funny one. Uh, they, it was a time like now when snow was plowed up a lot and there was an area in a parking lot uh, along the river with the, it was a parking so it was well lit up which made it rather interesting uh, and I was looking at that and it was it was quite late as uh, crows should have been in their roost or staging somewhere but these were sit handing around a dozen crows and they would get to the top of the snow pile and I thought well what next they slid down it and I thought, well, that was an accident. They slipped. They walked around and went up and slid down it again. They were a bunch of kids thoroughly enjoying sliding down this probably six feet of snow and then walking around and trying it again. I think the most embarrassing was that story I related about telling someone I was going to show him 10,000 crows sitting on the ice and there wasn't one. But um, <laughs> so if there's anything that, um, anyone asked you for bill please um you know just let us know and we'd yeah. be happy to help thank, thank you so much for joining us tonight uh as everyone can see on the screen uh they've put their email address so if you have questions you'd like to send them they'd be happy to give try to give you an answer so thank you again to everyone for joining us tonight and uh, we hope to see you next month march 16th Good night, everyone. Thank you, Bill. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thank Nick. You. It was fun.